Hard Talk is on the road in the far west of Alaska, America's frontier state. The fishing community here, big business, and the US federal government, all of them are locked in a bitter argument over environmental sustainability and resource exploitation. The waters off this coast contain one of the world's great wild salmon fisheries. But 100 miles or so over there, there's a plan to build one of the world's biggest copper mines. Can those two forms of resource exploitation coexist? Well, the answer may do much to settle Alaska's future. Fly inland from Alaska's southwest coast and you see a tapestry of streams, lakes and rugged hills. Wild and empty. But for how much longer? because the rock down there contains huge deposits of copper along with gold and other precious metals. The mining industry senses an historic opportunity. 11 billion tons of copper ore could soon be shoveled out of these hills. The only way into the mine site right now is by helicopter and when you're up in the air like this, you get a sense of just how remote this place is. They want to dig the big pit down there. They also need to build a power station and develop a road or rail link to the sea so they can get the copper out. It is a vast undertaking and it's going to cost many billions of dollars. John Shively is a mining boss who thinks big. When he scans this landscape, he imagines a vast open pit mine, thousands of jobs, tens of billions of dollars of profit. It's a world-class copper prospect uh, with a very significant gold find on top of it. What we're looking at is a, a mine that probably could last 70 to 100 years. The Pebble Mining Company, a joint venture between Britain's Anglo-American and Canada's Northern Dynasty Minerals, has already done extensive test drilling, not just to chart the mineral deposits, but also to figure out how and where to dump billions of tons of waste or tailings. There's a, a lot of waste, but the waste is essentially dirt. You know, pe people think about waste and they think of toxic and they think of poison. Yeah, it's, it's toxic dirt. No, it is not toxic. You, you cannot allow it to enter the ecosystem here. Well, we, it ha does have to have long-term monitoring. There's no question about that. That's, you know, and, and mining companies didn't used to do that. So we, we will not only have to monitor, we will have to put up a very large cash bond. It'll be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So even if we're not here, there's, there's capacity to continue to monitor. This is where the headwaters from the proposed mine site end up, Bristol Bay. Every summer, vast numbers of salmon swim through these waters from the Pacific Ocean, heading to the lakes and streams where their lives began. It is one of the richest fisheries on the planet. There is no other fishery quite like this anywhere in the world. There are hundreds and hundreds of fishing boats down below me, all of them with their nets out, pulling in thousands of wild salmon. 40 million salmon converge on these waters for just three or four weeks every year. Local Inuit fishermen are joined by a fleet of boats from Oregon and Washington State. On a good day, they can haul in two million sockeye and king salmon between them. The fishermen now fear the delicate balance between man and fish is threatened by the plan for a huge mine in their backyard. Robin Samuelson, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. What is it about the Pebble Mine project that has got you and so many people in this community so worked up? If those 
tailing ponds that they're planning on construct, constructing two miles by six miles by 300 feet high. If one of them breaks, war history. Bristol Bay is no longer Bristol Bay. We have a culture here that's depended on salmon since God created salmon and man, and we're not willing to risk it. Would your grandchildren rather be out in the cold in all weathers fishing, or would they rather have a very well-paid job on a mine that will probably last for the next 75 or 100 years? If my grandchildren were standing right here, they said they'd rather be fishing. Salmon is a billion dollar business in Bristol Bay. The Ocean Beauty canning and processing plant can handle tens of thousands of fish a day. These may be wild salmon, but it's extraordinary how industrialized this production process has become. There are 350 workers in this one plant alone. They're producing salmon for the freezer, canned salmon as well. And when all of these fish leave this factory, they're going to be worth an awful lot of money. Salmon is the mainstay of the local economy. In all, roughly 14,000 livelihoods depend on the Bristol Bay fishery. Salmon is at the heart of the history and the culture of the small riverside town of Dillingham. How else do we tell salmon apart? So one way to tell them is the eyeball. Inuit community leader Kim Williams runs a summer camp teaching local children how to gut and smoke the fish. And you see how close that is together? Subsistence fishing has been the cornerstone of indigenous life here for millennia. So who wants to try it? The vast majority of tribal organizations in the Bristol Bay region have now joined the campaign against the pebble mine project. Kim Williams, welcome to Hard Talk. Just tell me how important the fish are to your community, to your culture. For us, it's part of who we are. It's our identity as Alaska Native people. And if we didn't have it, I can't imagine not having it. But can you not see the big picture here, that the mine could bring to this region unprecedented economic growth. They're talking about 16,000 jobs during the construction phase, 15,000 jobs long term when the mine is under operation, a massive boost to the regional economy with unbelievable tax revenues for the region and for the state. It's not this for could, this region. This could transform. It is not for this region. It is not for the west side of Bristol Bay. We have 14,000. So you're just 000. mad because you're not getting the benefits nope, other nope. people, other native no, communities absolutely are. Absolutely not. We have 14,000 jobs that come from this renewable resource called this commercial fishery. We have households in Bristol Bay that fill their freezers every year and their smokehouses every year that will lose out when Exxon Valdez spilt oil in Prince William Sound. We didn't have any oils coming on the shores of Bristol Bay, but the prices of our sockeye and our king salmon dropped. The commercial fishermen of Bristol Bay lost a lot of money. We can't afford to lose those 14,000 jobs. The co-owner of the Pebble Partnership Company is a huge mining conglomerate based in the United Kingdom called Anglo-American. If you could walk into the boardroom of Anglo-American right now, what would your message be to the CEO, to the directors of that company? Well, I've done it on several occasions. I've already gone to London um, and walked into the boardroom of Anglo-American, and our message is the same every year that we go back during their shareholder meetings. It is in the wrong location. We're against the development of Pebble, and we want you to divest. Inuit opposition to the pebble mine plan is not unanimous. Iliamna, the settlement upriver closest to the proposed mine site, has reason to see the project in a more positive light. It's where Pebble has a logistics base, bringing jobs and money into a community desperately short of both. 
In the last decade, the population here has been in decline, and some locals see the planned mine as their last best hope of economic salvation. Lisa Reimers of the Iliamna Development Corporation is a fervent Pebble supporter. To those who are very worried about the mining project and all that it brings to the ecosystem here, it seems to them that you have been bought hook, line and sinker by Pebble Mining. That's what we've heard and you know with, with the Pebble Mine I think what you have to look at is you have to do your own research. You can't get caught up in the propaganda. You have to do your own research on the companies that are here, the companies that own Pebble, to see if they can do mining properly. Why are so many native communities and so many representative tribal leaders absolutely against the mine project? I see a lot of the local leaders getting caught up with the propaganda. They're not doing their homework. They're not actually finding out more about mining on their own and making their own decisions. But they say the very same about you. They say that you're not doing your homework because you're so keen to take the, the goodies that are on offer from the mine. They may say that, but to us, we're doing the best we can with the facts based on science, not based on fear mongering. Because of the presence of the mine project, there's a danger that communities around here are being torn apart. How worried are you about that? If you take communities like Dillingham, who are 120 miles away, there was no connection before with us, culturally or traditionally. We don't even really know them over there. You make it sound now like uh, when it comes to this mine project, it's every man and woman, every tribe for themselves. And if you can get something out of it, great. And if you can't, then you're probably going to oppose it. Is that the way it's become? The way I see it, because we are so open-minded to business, why are we such bad people? Because we want to survive, why is that such a bad deal? Alaska is wilder and more untouched than any other corner of the US. The state prides itself on its natural wonders. Untainted waters, a magical wild salmon migration, and dramatic intervention from fearsome predators. It all makes for a seductive image of an ecosystem in harmony. The headwaters of the Bristol Bay, filled with wild salmon every year, are a key part of Alaska's wilderness story and one which the state can ill afford to taint. The likely impact of the proposed pebble mine on these waters and the fish is now under scientific scrutiny. Daniel Schindler, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Now you've spent the best part of 17 years working on aquatic scientific research in this Bristol Bay drainage area. Just how unique is this ecosystem? It's unique in a variety of ways. One is just the sheer vastness of it. I mean, the landscape here that is still undeveloped from the perspective of hydro dams, from uh, lack of hatcheries to produce fish, from lack of invasive species that have basically tainted nearly every ecosystem on Earth. Um, you know, those type of disturbances don't exist here in Bristol Bay. Um, in terms of salmon, it's, it's one of the most productive salmon landscapes in the world. Now, we are looking at the potential impact of a vast industrial project. And of course, they haven't got a concrete plan yet, but we have a pretty clear idea of what the scale of copper mine they're talking about would involve. What do you believe the main challenges are for them to overcome to get the permissions for this to go ahead? We know that the waste that will be produced through this mining process will have to be contained um, for centuries, if not millennia. We know that uh, water moves freely across this landscape. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, precipitation here, rain and snow. We know the surface is covered in gravel. That's why salmon have been so uh, productive here, is because there's lots of habitat, water flows everywhere. Those same issues make containing mine waste a huge challenge. The company insists that the way they are going to manage the waste will ensure that toxicity does not enter the drainage system. Can that be done? That is 
you know, the, the solution, as far as I understand it, is about physical containment of a tailings pond that is kilometers in scale. And uh, you're doing this, the proposal is to do this in an area that's seismically active, in a place that has extreme changes in climate. History has told us that containing uh, mining wastes of this scale is very, very difficult. Pebble Mine has become the most controversial project of its kind in Alaska's history. But in the face of fierce opposition, the mining boss isn't backing down. John Shively, you would accept, would you not, that there, there is a, a fundamental clash of interests here. There, you know the coppers here and the gold too, and you want to exploit it. But you also know that we sit right now, right here, in the watershed area of one of the most important, indeed unique, wild fisheries in the whole of the world. Well, you know, I don't know how much of a threat actually we are considering the size of the ecosystem. We're a very, very small piece of that ecosystem. It is an important fishery. And one of the things we've said all along is if we can't prove that we can coexist with the fish, then we're not going to mine. We don't want to do that, and we won't do that. That's but, one but, of the... but, but, but hang on. You at Pebble are backed by two very big international mining conglomerates. Well, one, one Canadian, one, not so big. one <laughs> British. And their shareholders, frankly, want you to deliver them vast profits. And this mine could deliver tens and tens of billions of dollars to your backers. And that's what this is about. Let, let's not mince words. Well, it is about that, but it's also in the 21st century, uh, it also is about protecting the environment and enhancing local opportunities. It's not just about getting the money. I, I, I certainly agree that that in, in the past, you can go have example after example of how mining companies have done that. It's, it's first of all, not any longer in the best interest of companies to do that because it costs them money but, over the long run. Right. Let me just quote you this, this point from one of America's leading academic experts on mining, Nicole Vieira at Colorado State University. She says this, she says, frankly, there is no such thing as a no-risk mine. Would you accept that concept? Yes. So you are prepared to take risks with this particular environment? Well. There's no such thing as a no-risk mine. You can mitigate those risks, and that, that's what we have to do. But and why I, even contemplate taking risks right here in such a unique, unique environment? The, the, this isn't a unique environment. Th this environment exists over a huge area, uh, over the size of states. Sure, but you, we're talking about a watershed which runs into the Bristol Bay, which is the world's greatest wild salmon run, period. It is period. unique. Right, people think that we can destroy the whole fishery. We cannot do that. The amount of material that we're taking out, uh, even if it all escaped, which is not possible to have all of it escape, would not destroy the fishery. It just wouldn't. Why do you think that the overwhelming majority of people in this entire region are opposed to your mine plan? They have fears, and those fears are legitimate, about what the mine might do. I don't dis disregard those fears. We have a very high responsibility to, to show people that we're not going to do what they're afraid of. Will we be able to do that? I don't know whether we will or not. There are said to be something like 10 billion tons of copper ore below our feet. Give me a, a ballpark figure of how much that could be worth to your company. Well, the, the total in place value that people have talked about is in the 300 to 500 billion dollar range. But, Hang on, just run that by me again. You're talking about half a trillion dollars, potentially, but, of copper below But you don't feet. get that for free. But that is one heck of an incentive for you to do whatever it takes to get that stuff no, out. No, you know, actually, it's the other way around. It, the, because what it does, if you, in order to build a mine in a place like this, you need a big resource. That's what gives you the opportunity to spend the money that you need to spend to protect the environment and mine at the same time. John Shively, 
thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Stephen, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for coming. Anchorage, Alaska's business hub. This city and the entire state have been built on resource exploitation. Though oil drives the economy, the mineral potential is also vast. The state's laws and politicians have long been hugely sympathetic to the extractive industries. But the Pebble Project is so big, so controversial, that the state may not get the final say. The US Environmental Protection Agency has been conducting an exhaustive assessment of the potential impact on Bristol Bay. So is the federal government about to pull the plug on the proposed mine? Dennis McLaren, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, glad to be here. Simple question, yes or no, do you believe it is possible, it is possible to develop a mine of the size that the Pebble Partnership is talking about in that particular area without having a damaging impact on the fishery? Well, what we know as a certainty is that this mine will have impacts on salmon. Uh, da you mean it, damaging ones? Yes, damaging impacts on salmon because it So your will, answer is no then? Well, my answer is that we have not reached final conclusions. Yeah, but if about you're telling me it's it going to have damaging safely. impacts on the salmon, that is the answer. Well, the what, answer is what, no, this cannot be developed safely. Well, what, what the mining proponents will say is that they can do uh, mitigation projects that uh, will compensate for the damage that is created at the mine site. Because you say up to 90 miles of streams lost. You say up to nearly 5,000 acres of wetland just gone. Now these are real changes to the ecosystem. So why not just be upfront with me and say, you know what, it's time to get real. This mine cannot go ahead without fundamentally compromising one of America's most unique ecosystems. Well, we haven't made those conclusions as yet. Well, no, I just wonder why you're running away from being straight. Well, I am being straight with you. What we've clearly said all the way along is we have certain authorities under the Clean Water Act. 404C is one of those authorities that Congress granted. We've used that authority very sparingly over the years. Have we you ever used, used it, it before? Before a formal planning procedure and a concrete plan has been submitted? Yes, it has been used uh, in advance of, of permitting several times by the agency. But again, overall, we use that authority very, very cautiously and very, very sparingly. Uh, this is, though, one of the last best places. And so, this is an area where we want to take a very careful and considered look at whether it's appropriate to use that authority or whether it is appropriate to wait for a mining plan, a final mining plan. We're going to take a very, very uh, considered uh, set of steps here to, to look at the science, make sure we understand the science and the potential impacts, look at modern mining practices, the potential to mitigate, and then decide at the end of the year when this assessment is done, what our next steps are. But we have not, I want to be very clear, we have not made decisions yet about whether we would use 404C. It's, it's actually technically your decision, but I just wonder, in all honesty, this is so big, so important, that it would go to Washington. It would go to the White House eventually, wouldn't it? Well, I don't know about the White House, but certainly this will be an issue uh, at the highest levels of EPA. In Bristol Bay, this year's salmon run and fishing season is coming to an end. Uncertainty now hangs over this unique fishery. The Pebble Mine project could change this remote place forever. It comes down to a question of economic, social, and environmental priorities. What kind of state does Alaska want to be?